train. So it's a perfectly natural phonological phenomenon that's happening. And the, and the child's representing that in the spelling. But if a teacher doesn't know where that spelling error is coming from, how in the world do you correct it? Right? How would you correct that? How would you help the child with that? I would do the same thing that I'm doing with you. I would show him the way my lip mouth is working when I pronounce it. I might give him a mirror so he can see what his mouth is doing. And then I'd give him a whole bunch of TR words. Because every TR word is going to sound the same. Trip. Trip. Same thing. It's always going to work that way. And I'm going to say, that's just the way your mouth works. But this is the spelling system for it. And, and through automaticity, doing it over and over and over and over again, all week, and then moving on to another concept, and then coming back a week later. Do you remember that? How do you do that? Ch -ch 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 -ch. Sound again. So reviewing it. Okay, what about this one? Brass. Right. Wrong. Okay, what you're doing is taking the same thing. You're taking this as a visual representation of G-R-A-S-S. -S. It's not that. Say it with the G, with the G. Not, not with good, but with Press for the same same exact phenomenon. You don't say dress. You're saying dress. Dress. So the, the child's doing exactly the same thing. I'll, I'll guarantee you, nobody here says dress. Dress. It's dress. So again, if you don't know where that error is coming from, and most teachers aren't taught this. In, in higher ed, in colleges of education, this is not taught. So if you don't know where that error is coming from, how in the world can you correct it? How do you get that change, though, that teachers are kind of taught? Uh, Which we need. Policy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there's another talk that I give on policy. I used to be part of this talk, and this was a two-hour talk, but I'm not going to do it tonight. But that's what we do. We, we made some substantial change. I'll tell you quickly before we finish. In 2006, I was uh, called to testify for a literacy bill at the legislature. And in my testimony, I, I was asked then to serve on the reading task force, statewide reading task force, which charge was to look at the credentialing requirements of teachers of reading and make suggestions. And uh, what was supposed to be a one-year commitment ended up being a three-year commitment, and it ended up being a, a bloody emotional battle uh, between what I'm talking about tonight and the other way, um, and which was highly represented in the reading task force. Long story short, after three years, a colleague and I who were uh, testifying, to get, um, testifying at that hearing were asked to serve on the reading task force. After three years, <coughs> uh, our code of standards was produced for K through six uh, teachers. But the big but was uh, the union would only allow it for new teaching candidates. So if you are just coming out and, and all of the Minnesota colleges and universities that have education programs, licensure programs, then had to change their syllabi to match the new state requirements. And it wasn't until this past February they were given three years to make the changes um, and, their, and their students have to pass a new assessment to show the knowledge of the standards that we introduced through a bloody fight. But even if these young people have passed this assessment, which they need to pass in order to get their license, how can they go into a public school of 50 teachers who do things the other way and expect to make a difference? They're, they're just going to get overwhelmed. It's never going to happen. So until there's fundamental changes uh, across the board for all teachers and professional development changes, and we also know that if school leadership doesn't understand reading, it doesn't understand what needs to be taught, there's no hope that it will ever 
uh, change within the school. So school leadership needs to change and professional development needs to change. But this captures beautifully what I was talking about and my experience on the reading task force. I just, this guy, Reed Lyon, actually, um, I'm, he's a, uh, was with the National Institutes of Health, uh, one of the foremost reading researchers in the country, and, and hails from Vermont, the same town that I hailed from. And my mom actually taught reading, ironically, to his kids. Um, so it was a over the years. But I'd like to read this out loud because I get it, it fires me up when I do when I do. go back to work tomorrow and I'll fire it up. But the resistance of the educational community, particularly at the higher education level where teachers are trained, is enormous, almost unbelievable. This is obviously in respect to the teaching of reading. When you show people objective information, non-philosophically driven research, that for these kids, these interactions work very productively, such that where a youngster was at the 10th percentile in reading before, and is now at the 60th percentile in reading, and you can show that time after time, but you still see substantial resistance from the educational community, it begins to tell us that many of these issues are way beyond the kid issues. These are adult issues. They are fascinating adult issues where human beings are latching onto their beliefs, their assumptions, their egos, and their careers, rather than looking very closely at what works, what doesn't, making sure people know what works, measuring it, and getting the kids up to snuff. And that perfectly describes the resistance that we face and the reason why our reading scores nationally are where they are. And they're it's not easy. There are a lot of confounding uh, factors, single moms, poverty, uh, homes where literacy isn't valued because of their circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I grant all of that. But that, I believe, is even more reason for us to do what's right for the kids. Because I tell you, we're going down quickly the wrong side of the mountain. And I know from talking to business leaders in Minneapolis that there are businesses that will move out of state to find a literate workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and, and, and there are reasons why we're outsourcing to other more literate countries as well. So and, and it's it, <coughs> in this increasingly technological world we live in, and, you know, you've got to be able to read a manual to repair something. Literacy skills are foundational to make it in today's society. So we need to get it right, and we need to get it right quickly. So that, that ends it for tonight. Um, there are, I really encourage you to grab um, one of these outreach calendars if you haven't. We have many, 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 I think this is one of more than 30 workshops this year, most of them free. Um, and uh, I encourage you to come back. Can I ask a couple questions? Sure. So, um, it has to do with like, so Waldorf's philosophy is that you don't start teaching and reading until third grade, and it sort of flies in the face of what you're saying in terms of the research says by the time you're in third grade, um, you know, you have to ha be able to do it. So, I'm, I'm curious about these different <coughs> philosophies of when is the right time to learn to read, and you said early on in your comments that um, it's a really complex thing and we expect kids to start doing it at age five and six years old. So I just like, yeah. you know, there's well, some kind of confounding... Um, I'll say, I, I had my, my son was in Waldorf education <laughs> at the age of five and uh, he refused to go back <laughs> in January because he was only able to use a yellow crayon for the first six months. <laughs> And that was hardcore Waldorf in philosophy, but you know, you know, the, there is, a, there are a lot of people out there who, um, a lot of educators and other practitioners who just believe that a child will learn to read when he or she is ready, and don't hasten the process. Um, but at the same time, these practitioners aren't providing any structured sequential uh, reading instruction. And it's just. This, this, is weird. this is this is a reading approach. It's called the big book approach. So we sit in a circle 
and I read this to the to the children, and as I read it, I this is this is the explicit instruction of this camp. I went walking. What did you see? And I read the whole book again and again and again with the idea that if it, if it's the child's exposed enough, they will internalize the sound symbol relationships and be able to see the words and visualize the words 